Welcome to Lands of Legend Part 4. I am author J.K. Knaus, and here I'm going to wrap up the tour that I've been leading you on through medieval Spain, through the places that show up in my epic novel, Seven Noble Knights. In the last installment, we had traveled with our new hero, Mudarra, to Busto de Bureva, the home of his enemy, Don Yalambra. Here, Mudarra camps out in secret, doing reconnaissance, and meets a most unexpected character. The previous excerpts that I've read have all been about battles and monuments, but here I'd like to read a passage from my late husband's favorite chapter, Part 2, Chapter 5. He packed up some essentials in case he had to leave without visiting the camp again, and rode Tranquilo, his horse, to the river to wait for Blanca Flor, but only to question her about her parents and decide on a strategy. That was the reason he had come here, and he would fulfill it and return to Burgos to begin his transformation into the Christian knight who would bring the house of Gonzalo Gustios out of poverty and humiliation. The church bells tolled, echoing strangely off the open fields and buildings. He sensed stirring inside the buildings and glimpsed several servants heading toward the stable, hen house, and other animal pens. So he hid behind the main house and tried to keep an eye on the activities from the shadows. The angles were wrong, so he moved around the back corner, but found many small windows open to the morning light. He turned as quietly as he could to what was obviously going to be his post for the next several hours. People came and went all over the estate, but no one noticed the black horse and frozen rider in the shadows. The church bells tolled again and again. He prayed as best he could, although he had left his Koran at the forest camp, and Southeast confronted him with the stone wall. The movement and spiritual contemplations helped him ignore his circumstances, but he pressed up so close against the wall to avoid being seen that it couldn't bring him the concentration or the sense of community he had become accustomed to. Even his mother's face, his inspiration for the, all this patience and the questions he was going to ask, faded as he huddled next to Tranquilo for warmth. He focused instead on the cramps in his muscles and the sheen of cold on his skin despite his furry cloak. What kind of awful person would grow up in such an unforgiving environment? Blanca Flor answered his question, coming out of the house and pausing at the river as if looking for something. Mudara's muscles relaxed, and Tranquilo responded to the change in tension with a nicker. Blanca Flor turned toward them and grinned. Mudara took in the rows of neat white teeth and witnessed the material world with its grass and trees and anger and sorrow fade away. He felt no hunger or cold, but only joy. For a short moment, Mudara glimpsed paradise. He returned to earth in time to keep his body from falling over in a dead faint. Blanca Flor approached, looking even more like a beacon of light than she had the day before. She brought her mittened hand to his cheek. It was so warm and soft, he couldn't tolerate imagining what her bare hand must be like. How long have you waited here? She took her hand away. Some of the fibers in her mitten caught briefly on his whiskers like the legs of a fly in a spider's web. It was all he could manage to keep from grasping her hand and holding her to him. Since before sunrise, he answered. It's after midday now. You're not used to the weather. You must be hungry and cold. It's not so bad, he said, his teeth chattering. I'll try to bring you some food tomorrow, if you're coming tomorrow. She gazed demurely at the ground as if his answer didn't matter to her. He grinned, knowing he would return as many days as she would have him. Yes, I'll be back. What will you bring me? Do you like cheese? We've got a nice hard block of goat cheese we'll be cutting in tomorrow. Maybe I can fit some bread in my pockets without anyone noticing either. Anything from your hands would be as sweet as honey, he replied. In his days, he was committing bad poetry. And that's how a young man falls in love in 10th century Spain. The story returns to Burgos. This is the city today, seen from the castle. The castle is at the high point of the city, and some kind of defensive structure has been there since prehistoric times. Here, here we see the, the difficult way to get up to the castle. On the other side, it's a much easier climb. 
the castle was continually renovated and added to throughout the middle ages and only ruined during the napoleonic conflicts of the early 19th century i like to visit this castle and think about my characters taking in similar views a few very important scenes take place in this castle and then the chase scene occurs it's very very extended as you can see here <laughs> i amused myself making this google route with just a few of the places the villain Ruy Blasquez fled to, obliging Mudarra to chase him always a few steps behind. They started in Burgos, went up here to Amaya, way down south, then up to Saldana, through Monson de Campos, back up to Torre, uh, back all the way down to Duenas, and then they keep going south to Cabezon, and over to Aranda. They cross many rivers, and they cover three modern Spanish provinces for a grand total of nearly 500 kilometers, only to end up pretty close to home in Espeja de San Marcelino uh, uh, here in Soria. He is quite a coward, and spoiler alert, he meets a fitting end. Now I'm heading back east to show you, to kind of wrap this up, some architecture that would have been around at the same time as the characters in Seven Noble Knights. This quiet, hilly corner of modern La Rioja is home to the monasteries of St. Millán. There are two monasteries because by the year 1053, the monastic community had outgrown the original buildings. But for the first nearly 500 years of its history, this upper monastery served all the needs of the monks who wanted to follow Sam Mian's example and live more or less in the same cave that he did. The saint died in the year 574 and his followers built right into the mountainside. Here's the mountainside here, and you can see the part where um, the building kind of extends into the cave. That was the cave that Samyan lived in. He was a true hermit. The architecture inside is magnificently pre-Romanesque with some later additions, so it isn't hard to imagine what it looked like in the 10th century. These uh, horseshoe arches are a signature of the pre-Romanesque style, and the small proportions perfectly fitted the early community, which would have been between 10 and 15 monks. Out front, we have this wonderful restored arcade with floor decoration, all of these stones. They were laid in the beginning of the 11th century, so they say, and I think, well, perhaps they were laid at the end of the 10th century. What's a few years more or less? Because when I visited there, I couldn't help but imagine that my feet were stepping in the same places that my characters could have so what's important here to notice is all of these um, sarcophagi along the edge here. This more fancy one <laughs> belongs to a Navarrese queen. But there are, t are a total of eight simpler ones, and they are said to be the tombs of the seven noble knights and their tutor. Now, to me... There is no earthly reason why their bodies would have made it out here to be laid to rest. But it just shows that the legend has been woven into the fabric of Spanish culture. And to bring this tour to a close, I'd like to jump ahead a couple of hundred years. This is a model of what Burgos Cathedral looked like before the Gothic ar architects started in on it. In the basement of the cathedral today, they have what's called the low Lower Cloister, and it's a museum of remnants from when it looked like this. This is pure Romanesque, beautiful tower, very similar to the one that's in Zamora today, the Romanesque cloister, and the apse right here. One of the most impressive pieces in this lower part is this colorful Romanesque tomb. It's elaborate lobed arches, fanciful corbels, and lion reliefs. There's a lion right here and right here. Uh, they indicate that someone important was buried here. But who was it? Well, 
an inscription at the base here all along this slab <laughs> says that it, the tomb was the last resting place of a lady called Godo. But someone at some time since then, possibly when they moved this tomb from the monastery of San Pedro de Alanza to Burgos to um, give it a good reason for being there, I'm not sure. <laughs> Somebody started a rumor that this impressive sepulchre actually holds the earthly remains of Mugarra, our hero. And so the legend continues to this day. I'd like to thank you for following me on this journey. I hope you enjoyed looking at all my photos and hearing um, kind of the story of Seven Noble Knights. I have not personally been to all of the locations in the novel, but almost all of them. And as soon as the pandemic ends, I hope to round out the rest of them. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to write a comment in the YouTube comments or contact me on any social media. I will be putting links into the description here. Um, and that's all she wrote. <laughs> Thank you and farewell.